Previously, we have looked at uh, different types of advanced motion capture systems, like the optical marker-based system and also the inertial systems. Now we're going to look at how we can use regular video cameras for analyzing music-related movement. And when I, when I say regular video camera, that can be anything from the simplest type of web camera, like, like the one we have here, which is a consumer camera uh, that you can easily attach to your computer. And it's also the same thing as, as is typically built into your, your computer. It can also be uh, somewhat more advanced industrial type of cameras that we also use um, in, in a lab setting. Uh, these typically have better lighting system and also a larger chip so you get better images from, from this type of, of uh, camera. Um, up to more professional type of cameras where you have more advanced controls and better also uh, optics so that you can change for example the lenses and give good results, visual results. Additionally, another very interesting type of camera that has um, become much more affordable now in recent years is the one that we have in, in the Xbox Kinect and other type of cameras, which is a depth camera. So that can sense also the depth in the image, not only the plain two-dimensional image uh, that we typically have. So these we also use a lot in music research these days. So now we're going to look at how it's possible to work with video analysis on the computer. And here I have the program Maximus P open, which is a graphical programming environment that we often use uh, in music research. And I have different modules here for importing video uh, from the, the web camera that we have standing here now. And then I can see myself in the image. One important thing to remember when we're working with video analysis is that a video image is in fact just a set of numbers. And we can look at this here by seeing the, these numbers change as I move. Um, so these are numbers between 0 and 255. When working with video analysis, uh, one of the most common ways of starting out is to look at what we call the motion image. And a motion image is in fact just um, a, the, a calculation where we're subtracting the frames uh, following each other in a video sequence. What that means is that whenever there is a change between two frames, that will be visible. If there is no change, it will not be visible, as we see here now. So I have my original image here, and I now I do the calculation in grayscale, because that's a little bit easier for the computer to do. Then, as we see here in the motion image, it's only my motion that is shown and is visible. Then I can filter this to make it a little bit clearer and I can also add a noise removal filter so that uh, we can see the motion more easily. And possibly also I could add some edge detection, although in this case I have a very noisy background so it doesn't really help here. From the motion image itself it's possible to calculate various types of features. And one of the features that we work a lot with here in our uh, lab is to look at what we call the quantity of motion, which is, in a sense, the uh, sum of all the active pixels in a motion image. So we have the motion image up here, and when I move, you can see the white pixels. If I sit still, there is nothing. And by adding up all these pixels, we get a number called the quantity of motion, which we can see here in this blue plot here. So if I move a lot, we can see that. If I sit still, there's not very much happening. So in many ways, the quantity of motion is similar to also the activity that we can get from uh, inertial sensors, such, such as the accelerometers. And it's a good, good uh, way to look at the general, the general movement in a sequence. We can also calculate the centroid of motion to look at where exactly in the image we are. And also, for example, a bounding box, as we see here, as the, the square wrapped around the image that shows the extent of the motion. These numbers we can use for analytical purposes to plot, for example, with score material or with, uh, with some so sonic features. But since we also do this in real time, it's also possible to use this to create music. For example, in this case here, where I uh, t attach the horizontal motion to a piano sound. So I can play piano by moving here. Or Another example here with drums, where it's possible to play drums by trying to hit different parts of the image so that you can, you can control this in real time. So in a way, 
For a lot of the things we're doing here, we can work between analysis on one side and synthesis on the other very easily because it's, it's really the same thing uh, going on. Now, if you want to work more specifically on the analysis of, for example, larger stretches of musical uh, movement, we need to have some tools for doing that as well. And I developed a tool uh, or a method I call motion grams, which is a technique for visualizing movement over time. And could say that, well, is it really necessa necessary to visualize movement? Because movement, after all, is visual to start with. But the thing is that just by looking at, for example, a video stream, um, it's difficult to get a grasp of the or entire longer sequences uh, of, of movement material. So for um, these motion grams, as we see here, we get a plot over time of how motion evolves over time. So this is done by simply calculating the average for each of the lines in the motion image and then plotting them over time. And this can be done either horizontally or it can be done vertically, as we see here. So for, the, for this plot here, we can see the movement going up and down. Well, for this plot here, we can see the sideways movement. And together, they represent the, the, the musical movement over longer stretches of time, for example, several minutes or even hours. So if I sit still, there will be nothing. And if I move, there will be, uh, it will be displayed in these, these images. Now, as we talked about earlier, um, we're often working between analysis and th synthesis, where it's possible to either look at th things from a more scientific perspective or from an artistic, or po sometimes even in between. And again, from these motion grams that we looked at, it's interesting that they can also be used to create sound, because a motion gram is in many ways similar to a spectrogram of, of sound. So by taking a motion gram and interpreting it as a spectrogram, we can actually create sound from the video. Um, and here is an example of this, where I'm turning this motion gram into sound through an inverse FFT technique. And even more interesting here is then we can add, for example, a video effect and it will turn out to be an audio effect, like this blurring we're doing now in the image here will end up as some kind of reverb with some filtering on top of it in the sound. So these are just some examples of how it's possible to work with uh, video material on the computer, both for analyzing, but also analyzing relationships between uh, movement and sound, but also to create sound from movement.